joining us uh, for this short uh, press availability. Uh, so I'm going to let each of my members um, speak about the priorities that the Senate will be working on, and I'm going to start with Senator Costello. Well, thank you, Madam President, and again, uh, congratulations. I, I look forward to serving with you. One of the things that we talked about as a group is that we want to be listening to the Alaska public. And certainly what we have heard while listening is that uh, our friends and neighbors are frustrated with the level of crime in our communities, that the crime is undermining our sense of security and safety. Uh, there really is nothing more important than public safety. It affects everything from our personal family health to our economy. Um, losing a car or having a car taken from your driveway can uh, devastate your ability uh, to, to get around and your sense of, of safety. So we are committed to introducing legislation to address crime and finish the repeal effort so that Alaskans know that we are moving forward with a goal of safe, healthy, and thriving communities as something that, that we prioritize. And we are, we are all committed to that, and that effort will be led by the Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Senator Costello. And one of the things we're going to focus on as well, certainly crime and the Judiciary Committee, but we also recognize that crime is uh, affected by issues in health as well, the opioid crisis, frankly, to cut to the chase. And so I've asked my committees not to operate in silos, but actually to collaborate, because many of these issues cross different committees and different uh, subject matter. So with that, I'll turn to the Finance Committee, which everyone is interested in, as that's, uh, that's the main constitutional obligation we have, is to pass a budget. So I will ask Senator Von Imhoff if she would speak first. Thank you. So just to build upon what Senator Giesel stated in regards to collaboration across committees, with the opioid, using that as an example, we have asked um, the Department of Corrections, the Department of uh, Safety, and the Department of Health to actually work together to do a presentation on opioid abuse and how those three uh, agencies and departments are working together to address it. So rather than working in silos, how are they leveraging their resources, leveraging their personnel, their finances, their knowledge, their data, et cetera. So that's one of the examples that our committee is, is doing for that. Um, there has been, uh, in regards to, um, we had, we had a budget come out in mid-December, December 14th. Um, Governor uh, Dunleavy and his administration, it was somewhat of a placeholder budget. It did give us a glimpse of what to expect. We did have adjusted revenues, um, oil based on $64 a barrel. Um, we saw that we had a POMV, a percent of market value calculated from the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation. So we have our revenue uh, estimated as of December. Our expenses for um, were what Governor Walker had put forward um, in his budget that he had uh, published in early December. Those expenses have not been adjusted. And then we had a full statutory dividend proposed, um, yielding a deficit of about $1.6 billion. Uh, we expect the amended budget for the governor to come out potentially the second week of February. Um, on it, um, on a very high level educated guess, we believe there's going to be a reduction in administrative costs, merging some agencies and functions, diverting government services to the private sector, and potentially scaling back social services. From then, um, our committee will be looking at analyzing the budget. We'll be, we are preparing the framework now so that when OMB Director uh, Ms. Donna Ardwin puts forward an amended budget, we'll be ready to efficiently and thoroughly, thoroughly review and analyze the changes. And then we will then hold committee hearings uh, with the commissioners and agency directors and then eventually with the public to get their input. Um, I do want to put in um, a word of caution that even if we successfully reduce our state services in the next 24 months, unless we put restrictions on how our government may grow the budget, or how the, may, the government may grow, our budget could end up being substantial, st substantially large again when new oil discoveries come online. And that is why I, I believe that it is imperative that we pass an effectual spending cap. And so I just wanted to kind of get that in there. 
So the takeaway, what I want to leave you with, is that the Senate finance is focused on creating fiscal stability through responsible budgeting, slowing the growth of government, and protecting the permanent fund for the long term. And then I'll pass it to my colleague. Thank you. Senator Stedman. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and leading in on the issue of the, of the permanent fund, um, so let's just back up just for a little bit. I think one of the concentrations you'll see the Senate Finance Committee uh, do uh, and pay, uh, pay a lot of attention to, and that's just transparency. So I'm not really interested in having a shell game on the, at the finance table. No matter how uh, our deficit looks um, or actually structurally is, uh, we need to know about it so we can make the proper corrective uh, actions to fix the problem. And you can't do that by uh, shifting uh, funds from one year to the next and basically uh, playing games, financial games, and postponing the inevitable. We have rolled through about $14 billion in savings the last several years, and that's unsustainable. Any way you count it, we're basically backed into uh, the permanent fund uh, this fiscal year, um, next fiscal year's budget, I should say. We have about $2 billion left in the CBR. Uh, we have to have cash on the table uh, for emergencies. We just had one in Anchorage a few, you know, a little bit ago with some earthquakes. Uh, we don't know when the next one's going to be, or we may have a tsunami. Who knows? Uh, and then just general operations of the state. So I've expressed that uh, transparency concern to the OMB director, and I would expect the budget that the governor puts on the table to reflect that. Uh, and it will probably move the numbers, I would expect, 150, 200 million um, from last year's expectations. So with the transparency issue uh, on the table all the time, and again, no matter how ugly the issue is, it is what it is, and we want it on the table. Um, we'll be also paying a lot of attention to protecting the permanent fund, so that is not eroded for future generations. The last 40 to 50 years, we, uh, at our generation, have been very fortunate and had a huge oil boom wealth to build our state and support our lifestyle. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate for us to liquidate it over the next several years and give future generations nothing but an empty oil field. So we'll be very protective of the earnings reserve, um, which is unconstitutionally protected. And of course, the constitutional side, the corpus, um, you can't get to without a vote of the people anyway. So I think when we put some transparency on the numerics and we uh, hold a firm line to protect the permanent fund for future generations, we'll be making some pretty tough uh, decisions coming up this winter, which have to be made. And frankly, the sooner we make them, the easier they're going to be. Uh, I was uh, in the legislative or at the legislative um, arena when we, and at the finance table, when we set, a, set aside about $18 billion in savings. It's unfortunate that that's been eroded to the uh, state it is, and we haven't you know, fixed the problem. So the quicker we right the ship, the better. Um, we'll see what the governor's budget is when he puts it on the table. Uh, and as my co-chair has uh, expressed, it appears that they're going to put a budget on the table that matches reoccurring uh, revenues with reoccurring expenses, much like you do in private enterprise. That would leave us quite a substantial hole that we have to figure out how we're going to deal with. Uh, one way you can't deal with it is just ignore it and burn through the earnings reserve of the permanent fund. You will then not have any dividends, and you'll be in a position Alberta is where you go to the debt market just to pay your, make your payroll. And we're not going there. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the uh, hard work of the Finance Committee and working with the other body down the hall whenever they, you know, put their organization together and their team together. And I'll be working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with a larger committee, uh, along with my co-chair this year. We expanded it to nine to get a broader representation across the state. These are going to be tough decisions. Um, all uh, areas of the state are going to be impacted, regardless if your senator is from, um, you know, sitting on finance or whatever position he or she is. We're all in the boat together, and we want to make sure that all Alaskans are treated fairly in the reductions. Uh, or the, another way of putting it, the pain is spread equally around the state. But we have got to fix this problem. There is just no way out of it while sitting around waiting for oil prices to go up, thinking that's going to uh, 
bail us out. Tomorrow, uh, we'll be having some presentations at finance starting off, one of which will be the revenue projection. And I think it will be glaringly obvious when we look at the forward projections of oil production, uh, regardless of the price, doesn't fix the problem. We, we don't have the cash reserves to get to the future by ignoring the problem. So um, I'm, again, looking forward to working with the, all the senators um, and the finance, my finance co-chair and the finance committee to try to make this as painless as possible, but it's going to be a rough road for all of us. But we're all in it together. We're all in the same boat in the storm, and the only way through it is go through the storm. There's no way of backing up. So um, I look forward to working together with the new Senate president, who was very supportive to take this position. So it's going to be an exciting ride for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Senator Stedman. Senator Cockhiller is our rules chair. Senator uh, Cockhill. Thank you. Uh, part of what I've been doing uh, as we get together in the legislature is, uh, and a lot of it is housekeeping issues. So I've been working on that. There's uh, staff authorizations, things that we do to actually get this agenda through. Who is being hired? Where are we going to get our offices set? Uh, some of the press rules, uh, the quorum on the floor, things like that. So that is kind of dominated. But I can tell you, if those things don't go smoothly, then the agenda gets a harder time getting. And if, once those things are settled in, then our communication with the people of Alaska, uh, here's how I think of this institution. This belongs to the people of Alaska. We get to be running it. Uh, we get to run it as an orderly a fashion as we can and then help Alaska with their fiscal issues, their criminal issues, and communicate intensely with them as we do it. Certainly, the budget is going to be one of the primary issues. My responsibility, a part of that, is going to be to forward the agenda with a good platform to work off of. Uh, so that will be part of it. All the governor's issues are going to come to the rules committees to be introduced. Uh, there is a timing issue. And, and then working with both the other body and the governor are going to be critical factors as we move forward. So those are the structural issues that uh, I'll be kind of a part of the office management of. Uh, to make sure that this agenda gets a good hearing, uh, is well vetted, uh, and then our agenda is uh, put clearly on the table to help Alaska move forward. So my responsibility in this leadership team is going to be to help that agenda get done by making sure that we don't trip over ourselves doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coghill. James. James Brooks from the Anchorage Daily News. I know uh, all eyes are going to be on the House today. Uh, you all have your own business to take care of. How much does the House's inability to come up with a majority affect the work you're doing on the Senate side? And um, to, as a hypothetical, if it takes them two weeks to get a majority, what happens on your side as a result of that? Well, clearly the Senate is, is pretty constrained on what we can do. Uh, there are things we can, committee meetings we can go forward with, but we can't deliver messages to them uh, or invite them to join us in joint, joint hearings. Senator Coghill, other issues? Probably one of the biggest struggles is going to be uh, they have not been able to settle in their staff. Today, if they don't uh, gavel in, uh, their staff is not going to be authorized to be in the building to help them. So that, uh, that makes it even harder. And many of those uh, staffers have been a part of uh, even Senate staff in, in the past. So there's a lot of new. It makes it harder for us to communicate with them. That's all. And so they're going to be huddled trying to figure out an organization which keeps us out of uh, uh, communication with them. So it just it's a wall that uh, they have to figure out. Uh, it's important that they figure out. We don't figure it out for them. So in many ways, we have to stand back. Uh, but as a rules chairman, uh, uh, their staffing probably rises to the top level for me because that just settles a communication problem for us. Their Senate, uh, I mean, their House records people are going to have a hard time communicating with us. Those types of things. And we're a bicameral body. Uh, at this point, only one part of it is uh, up and running. Uh, so we're going to be uh, probably left to our committee structures, as the pre Senate president said. Um, so. Uh, we look forward to how they'll put it together. If I could Becky. add, if I could add oh, to that. Oh, certainly. Senator Stedman. Senate Finance Committee will start out full speed tomorrow morning. Um, we're going to go down and start um, reviewing issues and uh, 
putting the backgrounds together. We'll be waiting for the governor's budget. Might be a couple of weeks, but the committee will be in full process right away. The House will just have to catch up uh, later on, um, but they can be paying attention to some of these presentations that we'll be doing, and they'll be asking for similar stuff. So we're not going to wait for them. Uh, we're moving on, and uh, and the more time we have, the deeper we're going to dive into the problem to fix it. So watch Thursday at 4 when the committee announcements come out, the schedule for next week. Becky. Becky Barr at the Associated Press, and um, some of us will have to be leaving shortly for the House. But um, my question for um, Senator Sedman as Operating Budget Chair, you talked about protecting permanent fund earnings um, and limiting, I guess, what's out of that. Um, the legislature at some point is going to have to repay the CBR. Um, we had a budget cut last year, and people pushed back on areas like university, education, public safety. By what objective measures are you going to look at? Do you look at the budget and determine whether it's right sized? And w at what point does this stop becoming a spending problem and become a revenue problem? Well, there's mul that's a multifaceted question. Um, I think when you take a look at the at the permanent fund, um, frankly, you need to take a defensive position on it and protect it. Because the easiest course of action for the legislature to, make, to take is just to spend the earnings reserve. And that's unacceptable. So there will be a structured draw of some magnitude on it and a, and a dividend for all, for all the people. When we go through the budgetary process, um, some of those issues that you brought up or questions will default out. Clearly, we have some constitutional mandates. Education, for instance. We are not, so we'll be dealing, dealing with those. We're not going to close our prisons down and open the doors, close down the pioneer homes and put grandma out on the street. That stuff's not happening. Uh, so we'll be prioritizing uh, our spending. Uh, obviously, we are governed by the Constitution, so we'll be taking a close look at what we're constitutionally obligated to do. The other thing that's going to be challenging is a lot of uh, uh, spend expenditures uh, are driven by our statutes and requires the governor to do particular issues or particular items. So if we're going to have major spending reductions, we're going to need some statutory authority and changes to do that to make them stick. And I would expect the governor's office to submit uh, appropriate legislation to back up his budget. Um, so uh, we'll go through that process. And then when we get to the other side of it, I'll be able to better answer your question. Um, but clearly, there are some basic obligations to the citizens. Uh, we will most likely be reinforcing law and order around the state also, including troopers and village public safety officers and a whole litany of other angles dealing with uh, the courts and our opioid epidemic. So not everything's going to be in the, in the slim fast budgetary diet. Some things we're going to have to deliver and actually maybe even expand expenditures. Senator Von Imhoff. Thank you. Just to expand upon protecting the permanent fund, we passed last year a POMV, a percent of market value. It's five and a quarter of the last five years average market value for the next couple of fiscal years. And then starting in 2022, it just drops down to 5%. 5% is about the, um, is the common percentage for endowments and foundations across the United States and across the world. And I say this is that 5 percent is sustainable based on long-term market rates and market, um, market returns. To have an unstructured draw outside of the permanent fund, the POMV, that yield, that's basically taking more than 5 or 5 and a quarter percent that we have set up now. That's going to erode market returns, erode long-term uh, balances, erode the value of the fund. We do this for more, you do this two years in a row or longer, then you're going to starting to see diminishing returns. Protecting the fund meanings being disciplined with your draws, which we set up last year with the POMB. The second part of your question um, was how might we uh, look at the, the cuts or the budget, the amended budget that's being presented to us probably in a couple weeks. When we start looking at agency functions, uh, programs, services. We are coming up with a list of questions or a list of just kind of framework. How long has this program been around? How is it, how is it measured? How do we know that it's successful? How do we know that it's effective? 
what data or what measurability or effectiveness has been, uh, is in place? Can we take a look at that? How many people are affected? Is the private sector doing this work? Is it being duplicated by a nonprofit or, or a private sector? Could potentially make sense to outsource? Um, so those are some of the questions that we're taking a look at that we may ask, we're formulating now, that we, when we start analyzing the budget. Becky, I'm just going to add something else that's a bit more practical, perhaps. You asked about education. Uh, this summer, Representative Drummond chaired a bicameral committee on reading, a working group on reading. We heard a lot of up-to-date information on the brain science of reading. We know that we're, we're dead last in reading competency <laughs> in third, fourth grade. This is affecting not just the education system, but criminal justice, jobs, the ability of people to go forward and be successful. The brain science has, has shown a way that we can, teach, we can teach reading much more effectively. There is a, is, a, is a step we can take that isn't going to cost the budget a huge amount of money, but could make a huge difference in education, crime, and uh, job job readiness. So looking at those kinds of efficiencies, not just the dollars and cents, but how, they're, how these programs are applied. Yes, um, Andrew, <laughs> it took a minute for me to come up with your name. I apologize. No problem. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Media and KTOO. Senator Diesel, uh, you mentioned the opioid epidemic. Um, one of the areas that uh, legislators have ex and the governor have expressed an interest in reducing spending in is Medicaid. Uh, what are your thoughts on the interaction between um, uh, Medicaid and uh, health care services to low-income people and uh, treating people with opioid addictions? Opioid addictions cross socioeconomic lines. They are not confined to one demographic. The uh, issue is far more than simply a, a physical uh, issue. It is an emotional issue, frankly. And that's why I've been so focused on behavioral health and making sure the doors are open for behavioral health services for all Alaskans who are seeking those services to help with addiction issues and emotional issues that could lead to addiction. So again, these are often rules, regulations, that we, we, the bureaucracy, have put into place that can be corrected and, and actually change things dynamically without adding another penny to the budget. So again, looking at, at these kinds of solutions, uh, sometimes government is the worst enemy. Uh, Steve, did I see your hand up? No. Oh, it was it, Steve? Okay, one more question. Yes, and then I know you guys all have to uh, Steve Quinn with KTPA Channel 11. Uh, it just seems like every year, at the beginning of the year, um, we're saying the same things over again about the budget. How are you going to get to a point where you're not talking about deficits? I mean, it's been like that for about four to six years. Well, Senator Stedman has the answer. Well, I'll tell you what we don't do. We just don't go to the permanent fund and spend it and sit here six years from now with no earnings reserve and no dividend and have a complete financial collapse. Um, so you will see a budget that uh, is very, very skinny this year, and that will be the starting point. And you're going to, I would expect, uh, as referenced in some of the articles, that there might be a billion six to a billion seven in reductions just from the previous release on December 15th. So I think you're going to see a whole different set of cards sitting on the table. It's not going to be like the last several years at all. Uh, Senator Costello, a final comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, appreciate the question. What we've seen as far as the economy is that our economy grows through small business, and most of the business, or all of the job creation has been a, as a result of that. So I know my colleagues share an interest in making it easier for small businesses to be created, easier for, for small businesses to operate, and we certainly have heard that we have a ways to go to make Alaska more friendly for for those types of businesses. And I, I think that as you look at crime and help reduce that and you make Alaska a better place to live and raise a family, you make Alaska a great place to have a business, that you're going to see that we can pull out and we can um, make some headway on improving our state. And I certainly look forward to the, that positive uh, result. 
Great. Thanks very much for being here, everybody.